Yeah. Okay, we'll get started a couple minutes early because uh, first part's intro anyway. So, um, for those who don't know, I'm Brett Mogilevsky, and this is Diego Lapidus. Uh, we work for h &F, which is this really kind of amazingly weird unicorn organization. It's a, a digital consultancy inside the U.S. federal government for federal government. In other words, we're feds, um, but we do agile user-centered design, and uh, we do interesting platform stuff with Cloud Foundry, and we work with other federal agencies to help them solve their problems. Um, and we're working on something called cloud.gov. So this is a talk about that and what we're having to do to make cloud.gov uh, viable for the federal marketplace. Okay. Um, so ATF is filled with people like us who are, you know, like I said, they're user-centered, they're agile people, a lot of them came from private industry. And they get into government and the first thing we do is we make a bunch of software, like, okay, let's start iterating. Boom, 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 boom. We're starting to make things up. And uh, so you develop something maybe one to three months and you're ready to ship it. And we're starting to stack things up and like, let's get it out there. So we start to do that, but then that's not what happens. This is what happens. And so ATF is kind of new in the government. We're like, what's going on here? You know, why are we having such a difficult time and why is everyone else having such a difficult time? And it turns out everybody's having the same problem. You go over to all the agencies in the, in the federal space and they all have these problems. And it turns out it's all about compliance. This is like the biggest impediment. So if we, if we make software faster, we go faster and faster and faster and we iterate faster. If we can't deploy faster, then what's the point? All we've done is just feed a bottleneck. It's like having a freeway run into a country lane. So um, the process in the government doesn't look too much different uh, until you reach the bottom. So there's this notion that you have to procure and configure your servers. You're gonna have to set up your application. You're gonna run some security scans. And you probably have to do some documentation on it. Here's where it go goes left in, in the government. To document it for the government, you have to write docs for your whole stack. And I mean your whole stack. And the, and the standards are written around uh, physical data centers. So they th have things like fire suppression systems next to your hardware, like do you have that? How is that taken care of? Um, you end up writing to document your whole stack from the hardware up somewhere between 200 to 1,000 pages of, of documentation. And just to write that documentation, you have to know about oh, 4,006 pages of regulations. So this is in addition to the law. So, so FISMA, the law, and there's all this, this regulatory framework and this culture around, around risk acceptance that are built around it. And you have to understand all that. So that's a lot of information to be familiar with just to ship a digital service. So the way agencies have handled this typically is they'll develop these experts. They have these compliance experts who sit in the agencies. And they're the ones, they're, they're sort of these Talmudic scholars of, of, of compliance architecture. And they understand every single you know, OMB memo that's ever been written or every FIPS document that's ever gone out or the NIST standards that exist. And they're able to say, well, you know, the intent of this thing is this. Is this satisfying it? Yeah, I think we think so. Or no, it's definitely not or whatever. And so you end up with, with this bottleneck going around um, these people to try and get your software out. And so, you know, you might ask, how long is it going to take? You know, this is, you know, we're trying to get something out in the, in the public space. We want to serve the American public better, and they're complaining about digital infrastructure for the government being terrible. How much longer is this going to take? Well, the government doesn't have great stats because um, it's spread across all the agencies, but the bell curve, it says the middle is around eight to four, or six to 14 months to get what's called authority to operate, or ATO. That's authority to operate your service in the public. Um, so six to 14 months to get an ATO, you can imagine the effect that has on your team. Because now they've tried to deploy something, but they've spent all their time in actually the compliance and deployment side of the equation, even though they spent a very short amount of time actually developing their software. So you can imagine the effect this has on them, on their morale, on their momentum, on their ability to learn. It's a huge uh, deterrent to people in government actually being able to keep up with the bleeding edge of software because they can't iterate quickly. So this is a huge problem. The other thing that's happening in government is that, as you all know, speed equals security. And there's a message from Pivotal here at the conference, which is about, uh, you know, repave, re, re, you know, I can't remember what, the, what it was, but there were the three words. But basically it was like, get back to a known good state immediately. Repave the world. Um, and the speed with which you can deploy a change or a fix is huge. Um, there's no, we, know, we all now know there's no such thing as a secure system. There's only systems that haven't been broken yet. There's only systems that are not yet, uh, we, we're not yet aware of the vulnerabilities that they're uh, subject to. So speed becomes a huge factor in making these systems secure. So if we're gonna do things with the federal government, we don't want every single agency and every single team to have to figure out how to get things going really quickly. So speed becomes a huge thing. So for ATF, when we came in and we said, okay, we're having this problem, we better figure it out for ourselves and then make sure it works for everyone else. So we looked at this problem, we said, okay, this is kind of where PaaS fits in. Um, we deployed Cloud Foundry and a couple other options internally. We actually tried the configuration management route for a while first and found that didn't work out for the exact same reasons that were described in one of those keynotes, which is that you know, the developers don't really want to work on your Chef Puppet and, and Ansible and God knows you know, Salt, whatever other uh, manifest you have. They don't really want to work on that. They want to work on their code. Um, so we end up going the PaaS route um, and deploying uh, Cloud Foundry as something called cloud.gov, which is the product um, 
Diego's kind of technical and biz lead, and I'm kind of product lead on this side. And um, cloud.gov is built pretty much soup to nuts on Cloud Foundry, and not just Cloud Foundry, uh, the technology, but Cloud Foundry, the community. Um, we, as the federal government, have a hard time buying things, so working with the vendors is very difficult around stuff like this, and we also have these really kind of, I wouldn't say unique, but sort of uh, specialized compliance issues that make it harder for vendors to work with the government. So um, we're basically taking Cloud Foundry and adapting it and making sure that we do everything that's possible in our deployment to make sure it's actually gonna be compliant with federal architecture. So we're gonna go into a little bit of the changes that we've had to make um, and things we've had to tackle. None of them are huge technical lifts, but there may be things for people to be aware of. Um, I'm gonna say everything that we have done is in the open. Um, we have it all in GitHub. It's all there for people to follow and use and uh, follow our path. So um, we're gonna talk first about federal compliance. I'm gonna try and stick to one slide because it could be really nightmarish. You can say 4,006 pages, and I'm gonna try and do it in, in one slide. Um, but basically it works like this. Uh, FISMA is the Federal Information Security Management Architect Act of 2002, and it says all kinds of things about uh, what you're supposed to do with your systems. And it makes reference to these NIST standards. So basically you say, my app is how sensitive? You say low, mi low medium, or high. That's the FISMA level. That level implies you have to obey these NIST controls. And NIST has these very exhaustive uh, specifications for different kinds of access control or in information integrity and things like that. And that's the NIST 800-53 controls. So you're supposed to determine for your app, what is my level, which controls do I need to obey? Then you have to take that into consideration as you build your service and document it, uh, which is a very waterfall process, typically. And then you have to verify both the docs and the systems. They have to verify, if you make an assertion in the docs that you've configured uh, this hardware in this way, they're actually gonna go verify that you've configured the hardware in that way. They have to actually say, yes, not only have they, have they documented this, but the documentation is correct, it's true. And then so, at the same time, they have to then also uh, verify the system. So that's gonna be uh, looking for holes, looking for your security posture, looking for uh, vulnerabilities, and how do you uh, roll things out? Um, so they're gonna be object, um, uh, looking at all that as well. Sorry, the type is really small here. Um, and then ultimately, there's an authorizing official. So this is the, the usually it's the chief information, information security officer for an agency who's going to accept the risk. And the accepting the risk says, okay, all, all these other things considered, the rest of the things, I accept the risk of the running the system is relatively low, I'm gonna give it authority to operate, ATO, so it can be out in the public. Now, uh, the number of controls we're talking about is, as it says there, 255 or so, that's for FISMA moderate. If you go to FISMA high, which is like the high security applications, then it goes through the roof. But basically, there's a huge number of concerns here. So um, we're trying to get them on the platform level, and the uh, federal compliance architecture has something called FedRAMP, which is basically aimed at platforms. It's aimed at SASs and, and PASs and IASs that are gonna have a lot of tenants, and the idea being that they're gonna validate everything they possibly can about it, and then that is a signal to the rest of the government that they can build on your stuff with impunity. And the way they do that is there's actually like this triple um, approval from the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, and the General Services Administration. Those three CISOs are gonna look at this full package, including this exhaustive months-long assessment, to decide to accept the risk and say, yes, you have authority to operate as a platform, as a provision of platforms, so now agencies can work with you, build their applications on top, and save all kinds of time and effort. That's how compliance works in the government. Okay. Um, so what we're doing is we're addressing this by layers. So what you do is you say, um, there's, there's still these four layers that you look at. So there's the human or organizational layer, like who's actually running things, who's staffing it, how's that, how are those people validated, how is their access controlled as they enter and leave the organization, and so on. Um, there's the IAS layer, which as we know is just you know, a cloud, and, and as, you know, you're all at the Cloud Foundry Conference, you know that Cloud Foundry is sort of turning the IAS layer into sort of a commoditized layer, but you can leverage a lot of the stuff that was already done if you pick, uh, pick one, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then the PaaS is where we're kind of focusing all our effort and energy. Um, which is to kind of knock out as many of those controls as possible and leave as little as left to do for the application layer. In the application layer, we're trying to get the number of controls they can do down to something that any team could handle, any two pizza team could handle. And then to that, to that end, we're, we're providing facilities to help that team do that more easily. So um, we're gonna give you some of, the, some of the tips, things that we've had to go through. Uh, we're in the FedRAMP process right now, we're in what's called the FedRAMP ready state, which basically means that uh, they've done the course assessment of our tech and our processes and things like that and say it looks pretty good. Now comes the exhaustive, you know, months long process. So, Fingers crossed, by the end of the year, we'll, uh, we'll be full, fully FedRAMP uh, compliant. Um, do you want to start from here? Sure. Okay. So, you know, we, we decided to build a platform, but the reality is that we need to build it somewhere. But um, you can choose to use a data center. You know, we have plenty of those in basements all across DC and Virginia. 
Um, but we wanted to, you know, move to the cloud, move to use um, a provider that can give us good architecture. And we decided to um, use a public cloud provider. Um, let me try to, okay. Um, that, there's no way to. It's not really showing much. Okay. Um, it's really tiny. It's <laughs> Our previous slide is about this, it's poster stamp size. So. Sorry. Um, yeah, so basically we, we decided to use a public cloud provider that had their infrastructure approved, that had federal compliance, that, that had federal compliance already done, and that we can just leverage, right? So a bunch of the controls that you would normally see uh, somewhere else, you just inherit them by using a, an approved cloud provider. Um, the cool thing is, you know, we use a pretty popular one. I'm, we use Amazon, so like you know, it's the same thing that everyone else is, uses. But uh, we can be mobile. We know we can move. Yeah. So one of the cool things about Cloud Foundry is that it, it doesn't lock us in into anything, and um, if anything happens, we can just move along. And that was one of the key features that we liked that uh, about Cloud Foundry when we selected it. But the thing is, when um, you talk about cloud, I think that there are three rules of cloud, and that is. Automation, automation, and automation. Um, you know. Automation, robots all the way down. Yep. It's gotta be robots all the way down. Um, so we are automating pretty much everything with Bosch and Concourse. Um, we, you know, you track the public CF release from GitHub. Um, we have custom manifests in GitHub too, if you wanna go check it out. Um, you can do that. Um, one of the cool things about having everything in GitHub is that we have one authoritative source for everything that we have, right? Like, we know that if anyone comes in and does a, a change to one of our repos, um, what that change was, and we can track why that happened. Um, moreover, we have you know the pull request process of um, someone having to look over any change that goes into any repo. Um, we also, you know, use, as I say, Bosch for everything. Um, we have a bunch of Bosch releases, um, and we use Concourse to deploy all the things. Um, our main, one of our main pipelines looks like this. It's growing to a point you can't read things anymore, uh, but it's pretty cool. You know, if you guys haven't checked out Concourse yet, you definitely should. Yes, uh, it has been extremely useful for us to use Concourse. Um, but one of the cool things is that with Concourse, we can, we can do Bosch releases, we can do, we're doing Terraform now, we're doing CF apps, we do custom stuff with uh, security scans. You can do pretty much whatever you want. Um, so all of this allows us to you know, have a lot of benefits when you're doing um, government work. When you're talking about compliance, when you're talking about security, um, automation is really crucial, right? Um, all, all of these things, right? Like, you know, we can repeat any, any deployment, whatever you want. Um, if there's any um, disaster recovery issue, like, you know, if Amazon went, happened to go down, we can redeploy everything in, in a different region. Um, it allows us to have a very good audit trail. So usually um, in any other data center environment or any other um, agency, what they will look at is like, what are the logs for the chef runs? or what are the logs for um, the SSH access? But here, what we show is like, you know, the, the Git history for our GitHub repos, the Bosch audit logs, the Concourse build logs. Um, those are all things that can really help us when we're talking about auditing. Well, often they're looking for things like a change review board. Like, yeah. what is your change review board process for deploying code in production? How do you make sure that what lands in production is what was supposed to? And, and we just say, well, there's hashes, and you can look at the hashes all the way across and it's automated, and so no humans have to do it. It's just here's the pull request, and here's the person who approved it. So there's our change review board. Yep. And that, that kind of blows their minds in the federal compliance architecture because people don't do it that way. 
Um, but they all look at this, the NIST standards and say, yeah, that, standard, that satisfies the controls. Um, so that's, you know, modern techniques that are in this community are really going to apply. Yeah, and the, one of the things it, that um, it was really important when we were talking about compliance is like, we are going to the core beliefs of people, but we need to um, show how we fit the controls, right? Like how we fit all the compliance tags that the concept was made for, right? Like um, you, you're, you're not talking about like how using Chef. You, you're, you, the, the control is, do you have your configuration somewhere that it can be audit, audited, right? Like, so that's what we're doing. Um, so when talking about security, Cloud Foundry has a lot of cool security features, right? Um, the stem cells by the, you know, are hardened already. Um, you have um, the, the user management piece of UAA is fantastic. Um, the, even with, within the cloud controller or the, all the permissions are really well organized. And that really helps us, right? Um, there's also like the logregator and the audit trails that um, it provides are extremely useful for a compliance world. And, um, you know, we, we take, we took the Cloud Foundry security from the get-go as a, you know, a starting point. But we needed to, you know, move from there into deeper things. So we started with host security and the, 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 the Bosch automation pieces allowed us to um, take an iterative approach to how we deal with security at the host layer, right? We created a Bosch release, we test it, then we apply it to all the servers, and we know that everything is uh, consistent across the board. Um, these are some of the things that we're doing on the host security itself. Um, the, you know, we track the upstream stem cells. They're usually updated pretty often. Um, if there's a, an issue, there's a uh, vulnerability in Ubuntu. Um, again, the, the, the last time it was like a day that, that we had a vulnerability open. Um, we do stem cell hardening. I mean, we have a Bosch release that is called CG Harden um, that applies pretty basic hardening scripts to the stem cell. We do vulnerability scanning on all the servers using Nessus. If you're not familiar with Nessus, it's just a, you know, a security scanning tool that you can use to um, scan all the OS and network. We are starting to do integrity checks on all the files using Tripwire, which has been pretty cool. You know, so far so good. Um, we because we're using Amazon, we are forwarding all the logs from the platform to CloudWatch logs now, and hope, hopefully setting alerts soon. Um, and you know, we're using Bosch to deploy all of this, and again, it allows us to be consistent across the board. Yeah, they wanted, initially the compliance side, they wanted to scan our entire set of machines. They're like, we don't know how many there are at any given time. And they kind of, that kind of made them explode a little bit. And, and, and they said, well, what, we need network access to those things. We need SSH keys on them. We're like, like hell you do. Um, so uh, we ended up deploying the Nessus agent, uh, which reports out. But by making it part of the Bosch release, it ends up you know, on every single machine. And so it, it really is kind of naturally done. But they don't have to change their configuration. We're using the agent to report in centrally. So that's worked out pretty well. Yeah, and all of these are, like, each one of those are single Bosch release. So if you're interested in any of those, you can just... Yeah, we're publishing everything we do. Yep. Um, regarding user access, um, you know, again, we use standard UAA. But one of the things that the, the UAA provides is the, the, it allows you to delegate um, user access to a platform. And that is pretty cool because it, may, it means that it's not our problem, it's someone else's problem, we don't care. We just, you know, add a thingy there that uh, says, you know, just log in with your credentials. And, um, you know, if someone gets fired, you know, don't come yelling at me because they had access, you could just disable in the single sign-on platform. 
Yeah, this, this saved us a lot of effort. I mean, I mean, if we tried to do MFA directly in UAA or replace UAA, it would have been a lot more work. But UAA is not altogether well documented, but it has all kinds of really interesting features. And one of them is, you know, if you go look, I think they're documented now better, but it, was, it used to be just like, read me how to set up with Okta. And it turned out that's a roadmap for setting up with any SAML provider. So whether it's Azure Active Directory or Secure Auth or whatever, and we're now looking at like, you know, we all have these government identity cards that, well, that's my bike locker. Uh, <laughs> we all these government identity cards that, that are, have like biometrics on and things like that. So we, we, by doing this, we're outsourcing that back to the agencies that have already invested in that architecture themselves. Yeah. So if you're going to sell something to the federal government, then that's a really good thing to look at is having UA delegate the auth back to them. And then it's their problem, uh, as opposed to it, it cuts out a lot of concerns from us on the compliance side that we don't have to deal with it. And just for future reference, we don't allow it, people to sign up with bike locker cards. Yeah, bike lock, oh, okay. yeah your bike lock doesn't work. Um, so. Um, another thing that we were interested in is how we can, how can we uh, allow uh, uh, operators and administrators to uh, access the platform uh, with, you know, with some security, right? Um, and before we had a very strict set of SSH credentials to jump boxes, but now what we're working on is something that we call ephemeral jump boxes, uh, and that's using concourse to, um, you know, build a container hijack that container and you know we have the credentials already in there that we got from concourse and you can just use Bosch and whatever and after you know I think it is like 30 minutes the, the, the whole thing disappears. Um, that way you know we limit access to concourse itself and then you know you, you only have access for, for a very li limited amount of time. Okay, so once we've got all that, so we still have all those pages of documentation. So we, we're, you know, we're working on the FedRAMP space to make it so that people are much more about like what is the system as opposed to what is the documentation. And the hope is that if we do this right, we have such economy of scale that people are going to do only the apps and they're not going to have to do platforms like this. So fingers crossed this will be the last time anybody has to do it this exhaustively um, if they're using our platform. But the idea is that um, we took uh, compliance. Normally it's 200 to 1,000 pages and it's, it's boilerplate. A lot of it's copy pasted from old systems and templates. And it's somebody's you know, weekend to go through and try and, well, more than a weekend, it's a lot of weekends going through <laughs> looking for tips and trying to figure out what changed from system to system. We said, okay, we're not gonna write any flat documentation. We want it to be like code. We want to treat it like code. So we decompose the way the documentation is structured. Um, and so we do it all as YAML data in GitHub. And then um, what we can do is we can, compose, we can compose it. So the same way we're composing our layers of like the h &F organization and then AWS is our AS layer and then Cloud Foundry is our, is our PaaS and then the app goes on top. We're basically decomposing our, our documentation ex in exactly the same way. Um, and then uh, we're actually automating the publication of that via concourse. So what you see here is like there's the standard, so NIST 800-53 is those com controls. And then the certifications, the different levels you might have, uh, FedRAMP low, FedRAMP medium, uh, LATO is a GSA one. But you could also have, and actually somebody contributed to us because it's open source, they contributed like a PCI mapping. Um, so to mapping to all these controls. And then you have your components, you kind of divide it out and say, okay, we're gonna document each of these things individually. And um, so what that looks like when you actually push it through Concourse is we, we deploy it in this Gitbook fashion. It's um, directly readable on the web at compliance.cloud.gov. Um, and we now are able to render it directly into the FedRAMP uh, Word template, which we're working on. Actually, somebody's working at the office today, um, which they require because there's a bunch of stuff they did with the structure of that Word document that's important to them. Um, and so now people can take this documentation and they can kind of um, recombine it on their own or, or switch it out and switch out with a different IS provider. And so if there's other people who want to follow our lead and become cloud service providers to the government, here's a paved path you can follow where we've, we've, we've kind of laid it out for you. You can replace only the parts that are different for you or amend them with things that are different that you're value add as a vendor. Um, the other thing that we're doing is like, we really want teams to have um, high confidence when they enter the compliance process that they're gonna succeed. So, um, and we want the auditors to have high, high confidence that when we say these, this is what's in our docs, and they have to go and say, yes, is that real now? That they can actually see that very, very easily. So we're actually using BDD, uh, Behavior Driven Design. It's a kind of, kind of test framework uh, where you basically can do sort of very human readable tests to say, you know, given this condition, when I do this, then this is true. And it's, it's auditor readable and so on, but on the back end there's code, they'll do things. So we have things that say like, you know, given if I go look in the Amazon console for this thing that we say is true, then I'll find that this, this thing is set to on. And we're actually like delivering not only the docs, but like stretches of BDD code that will verify that the docs, what's in the docs is true, so that we can basically be doing this continuously all day, every day, and if everything, everything ever falls out of true, we'll know. And also our hope is that we can actually get the FedRAMP auditing process down to the point where they will expect this coming in, and therefore the auditing process goes much, much faster rather than being months. It's just look for differences in, in, uh, and look at the implementation of the tests and not 
um, having to check everything manually, which is what they do now. So that's kind of a, a novel thing we're doing. Um, we're also making it so that uh, as part of that deployment pipeline, when we deploy the new version of the docs, we're also running all of our tests to verify the docs are true. And so it'll actually, in the published version of the docs, it'll say, last checked as of date X. Um, so that's really powerful. Because uh, we want it not only at, when we're getting compliance, but we want it after, uh, when we want to stay compliant. Um, the other thing we're doing is we're working on making sure that the teams that are deploying, we want to give them tools to understand when, you know, things that are within their boundary, that are not at the Cloud Foundry level, but that are at the app level, we're giving them tools to help them understand when, they're, um, uh, when they've got problems and give them high confidence uh, as they enter the compliance process and after the compliance process to be, to be continuous. So we have so this app, uh, automated uh, code quality and pen testing scans. Again, this is built on the back of the concourse, and we're slowly integrating a bunch of different tools into it. And then we have a viewer, which will give them uh, sort of here's, their, here's your current status, and then alerts that'll tell them, hey, you know, since yesterday, looks like you got a few vulnerabilities that are introduced. And those vulnerabilities might be because they pushed a new version of their code, or might be because the scans are picking up new stuff because a new vulnerability was, was going into the, what it's looking for. Um, and so that's what this looks like. Uh, this is what that looks like. This is currently sort of an internal HNF tool, but we'll be turning it into, you know, again, everything's open source. It's out there if you look for it, but um, we haven't made a part of cloud.gov yet, but it will be. So when you're a tenant in cloud.gov, this is sort of a service that you get. Um, and the goal here is for continuous compliance. So, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the federal teams have to jump through all kinds of hoops, and they get bogged down, in it, as we said at the beginning. So we want that it to be a lightweight process that, you know, they can get feedback immediately as soon as they start developing and sort of never fall out of true. Oh. Yeah, so we're going to start turning on some uh, questions. If you want to start submitting questions, you can use that. This is new. We're trying this on the fly. It's an experiment. Um, thanks, Google. Um, but the idea is that we want compliance to be something that becomes lightweight and sort of incremental changes as things are found and not something you have to do with this heavyweight, you know, single time process that takes months. Um, so we're not done. Uh, in terms of what comes next, we have a bunch of stuff we still have to handle. We're, like I said, we're, we're probably through the FedRAMP process, but um, even after, oh, now it's open to anyone if you want to use that link. <laughs> it wasn't a, a, a minute ago. Um, we have a bunch of stuff we still need to do, and so some of those are for compliance, but those are things we want to do for security um, that we're looking down. So uh, there's things there where we have to be really explicit about the boundary, like which things have gotten this scrutiny and which things haven't. If you bring your own build pack, we can't vouch for it, and that changes you know, what, you, what you're getting you know, your compliance around. But if you're using a supported build pack, it's compliant up to this level. Uh, same thing when we move to the Diego backend. If you're using you know, kind of blessed from images to build your, your app, we can make some assertions about that and include compliance masonry documentation with it. But if you're using your own from bespoke one, then maybe you're on your own. So we have to kind of work on that messaging to users. Um, the same thing in the services they're going to provision. If they're going to ser provision services through our marketplace, and some of them might not be provided by us, but by other agencies, it has to be very clear. Does this service have ATO? What is your responsibility? If you're going to try and get authority to operate, what is your responsibility with using that service? Um, the other thing is we're not yet doing active uh, container security. So once the containers are deployed, we're not really looking at the content very heavily. We're using Tripwire on the host side, but we're not doing anything in the containers themselves. So we're investigating things like Claire and AppDog that will um, uh, make it easier for us to understand what's going on there. And again, that's a service back to the people who are, who are relying on us for their code. And then finally, uh, we, we described that really cool uh, jump box thing we're doing with Concourse Hijack and the containers to, to do the ephemeral jump boxes through Bosch, which is lots of fun. But unfortunately, we're not auditing that as much as we need to, so we're going to be working on that. Um, and that's kind of it. Um, I'm going to go to questions now, uh, but if anybody's interested, these are things, places you can uh, talk to us or find out about us. That chat.18f.gov, that's actually a public Slack channel. You can get in, and there's us and a bunch of other people in federal compliance and government space who deal with these kind of things hanging out. It's a good place to ask questions and, and talk shop. Um, so I'm going to go to questions. We've got about three minutes. So um, let's see. Do you do binary security scans in your standard retinue of tests, static analysis? Um, we are doing both static and dynamic, um, but it's a very nascent pipeline. We're sort of we're recruiting a bunch of different tools and comparing them, mixing the results to find out best of breed and figure out, you know, okay, do we, how do we not alert multiple times on the same thing across different tools and things like that. So, uh, but yes, we're doing both uh, static and dynamic. And then we use tools like Code Pymed and you know Gymnasium and other. Um, public tools to scan our code because, you know, again, most of the things that we do, it's in GitHub, we can just use all of that to um, do the scans. Right. Um, are we running in, uh, I guess that means Gov region or of AWS or general? Um, ironically, the, all of our automation is saving our bacon now because it's turning out for a ver variety of reasons. We actually need to move from Amazon East West to Amazon GovCloud. Um, and in doing that, we're basically doing the last mile of our automation, which was actually provisioning the AWS environment itself. 
And that is true to the whole multi-cloud promise. It's making it relatively easy for us to figure out, okay, we're gonna redeploy on GovCloud and just keep rolling. And for anyone else in the compliance process, that would have been a deal killer. It's like, oh crap, we gotta redeploy? Start over. You're, and, and the federal people would have been, you're kicked out, but they see that we can do all this automation, like, okay, can you do it in a week and a half? And we're like, well, let's see. And so now we're off and doing it. Um, team's working on that right now. Um, why and how did you decide to use Terraform to set up your Cloud Foundry clusters? How are your experiences with it? Um, we started to automate with uh, CloudFormation on AWS, and it was just kind of very verbose. And there was sort of, you know, it would help the initial setup of the account and setting up some VPCs, but when it then it came time to like do things like set up a database that we needed and things like that, it was kind of a separate step and it was disjointed. We found that using Terraform kind of unified into one step made it a lot clearer and simpler, and also gave us a lot more confidence that we can take that across to multiple clouds. Um, we were a little skeptical. We didn't want to bring in Terraform in kind of like the last minute right now because we didn't want to bring another tool into the mix, but it's turned out that the team's been playing with it and they actually really enjoy it. So um, that's yeah. helped. Um, and the, the thing about Terraform too is that it is a bit challenging to you know, keep state with Terraform, but because we're using Concourse to deploy the Terraform um, you know, the, the, the manifest, uh, we, we are, you know, it, it's only Concourse, the one that it's running all the, uh, doing all the Terraform runs. So we can store, uh, we store state in S3. So uh, this is a big question. How are you going to help the federal government make the cultural shift? Many agencies have tried this and gotten crushed. How is this different? Oh, next. No. Yeah. <laughs> so this is tough. This is really tough. Um, uh, we have a lot of agencies that are stuck in the past and think they need data centers and they think they need to scan every machine you know, themselves and so on. Um, we are working with the agencies that are most flexible and most forward thinking first and working with them and showing success. Um, some of them are choosing to work with us on their own because h &F is working with them and deploying things for them. So as we've worked with these agencies and deployed things like the College Scorecard or Every Kid in a Park or Not Alone, like all these different sites we've done for different agencies, they've seen like, how the hell are you doing this and how are you getting ATO so quickly? We said, well, we're using Cloud Foundry internally and we're, you know, it's accelerating all these things. Um, so they're interested in how we're doing it. So we're, we're finding the agencies that are most flexible and working with them. But at the same time, we have consultancies going on. HNF has, is not just about this. HNF does all kinds of things, including organizational transformation consulting. So we're doing that with some of these agencies to help them understand how to be more agile, how to be more product oriented, um, and change the way they approach these things. So having a PaaS available becomes a tool for them to say, okay, well, imagine ops was much, much easier. Now, how easily could you shift your culture? And so some of them are very interested in that. Um, have you tackled secret injection in apps? For example, do, uh, do for example credentials get set as a CF app and VARs by concourse pipelines? We were just working on this yesterday. I don't know what the answer was. Um, the team was working on it. So I think that we use user provided services for some stuff and then VARs for some other. Um, I think that you know each application, each solution um, requires maybe some differences. We strongly suggest people to use user provided services for secrets, uh, and I think that's you know generally a good practice. Um, environment variables for secrets have some problems, especially if you do um, blue green deploys and that kind of stuff. So you know, I think that it's better to use um, user provided services if you can. Okay. Um, how much time are we saving through reduced compliance documentation? Um, it depends on the level of the app. So the app might have, it's an open data application. It's government data that should be available to the public. It's not sensitive. If the site is broken, it's no big deal. It's not a continuity issue. Uh, if it's out there, it's not embarrassed. It's just, it needs to be out there. And it's like, there's basically, if you broke in the server, you'd see the data that is driving the API, but you can get it all through the API in any case. Those things are very simple. We can do them just in a couple days. Um, we, we, we did one in like 90 minutes. We did one in 90 minutes, yeah. <laughs> but again, it's because our director of infrastructure, who is the authorizing official for this, has seen all this in the past. He knows exactly what we're doing, and so he, he can do the risk acceptance because he knows the delta is very small. When we go to other agencies, which is not stuff we're building ourselves, but other agencies are building, it's much more them accepting the risk and them ex understanding it. And so that's why FedRAMP is such an important thing. And when we get there, that'll help them. Um, but the goal is that, you know, even for really heavy applications, we want the time that the team spends writing documentation to be negligible. We want it to be something they can take in a two pizza team and not have a big deal. Whereas right now it's you get three people from an ISSO office to write this documentation for you. Um, and the last one uh, we'll take before we quit, uh, sorry we're over, is on the concept of a blessed build pack, does that create a bottleneck? How do you keep up with changes? So uh, first of all, we're starting with the community build packs because the Cloud Foundry Foundation is doing a really, really good job on um, updating build packs and updating stem cells. Um, we did see recently there was a CVE that was like, wow, we're waiting for that new build pad to come through. It's taking a while. <laughs> should we roll our own? What should we do? And it did come through, and we were like, we were just about to complain and say, okay, what's the actual expectation here? What should we do? Um, we don't really want to run our own and do separate, you know, fork it from the community. 
But then uh, the Cloud Foundry Foundation, uh, everybody seems like they're, building, they're breaking out the build pack separately. So the build pack is going to be shipped independent of the platform releases, which means the build packs will come through faster because that was held up on the, on the platform release. So that's already being addressed. So we're, we, this is part of the, the magic is that we're in an ecosystem where we know everybody else has the same, same problems. They all want those build packs to come through really quickly. Um, the blessed build pack, uh, again, we're just starting to take the ones that are part of the platform. We say we will support those, and those are the ones we'll have documentation for. For the ones that, if you bring your own build pack, we're basically saying that's your own bottleneck you're introducing as sort of a, you know, um, as a tenant, you're bringing your own complexity that you're going to have to deal with. You're, 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 at, you're bypassing some of the benefit of the platform. That's it. Um, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate it, and great questions.